Good evening, folks. How y'all doing? Well, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're going to change the format here a little bit. I'm going to give a, uh, a short little spiel here on FFF and then turn it over to uh, Cole from the Econ Society. Um, but welcome back. Uh, I see some new faces here. We're starting off fall 2011, uh, the Economic Liberty Lecture Series. And for those of you unfamiliar with uh, the Future of Freedom Foundation, we are a nonprofit libertarian educational foundation whose mission is to spread an uncompromising libertarian vision of society, uh, economic liberty, individual liberty. And we do it through a variety of ways, uh, through a print journal, Freedom Daily, which we've been publishing for over 20 years now. Uh, and also, of course, on the internet, we have a, a vast website uh, with over 3,000 articles on it, videos from all of these lectures and others. Uh, it's all available on the internet, uh, as well as uh, what we consider the finest libertarian newsletter that you can lay your hands on. FFF email update is free for the asking. You can just send an email to FFF at FFF.org. I uh, would subscribe in the subject line, or you can sign up out front. All of our literature is free out front there at the display. Please take anything you want, sign up for our newsletter, and, uh, and please check us out. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Cole, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is Cole Reddick, and I'm the Vice President of the GMO e Economic Society. The Econ Society is a student organization that promotes the economic way of thinking and organizes lecture series, discussion sessions, and other interactions between professional economists and students. If you're interested in getting more involved or learning more, catch up with me after the event or sign up at the table uh, outside there. Um, you can also join us tomorrow night in Enterprise 318 at 7.20 p.m. for our first meeting and welcome reception. You'll learn a lot there. Um, the Econ Society has the privilege to be advised and taught by many brilliant scholars. One of those helpful professors, Thomas Tristisi, is an instructor and the associate director of undergraduate programs for the ec economics department of, of GMU. Prior to teaching, he ran and owned a grocery store in Kansas City. He holds, a master's, he holds master's degrees in economics and public policy and a PhD in public policy from George Mason University. He is the editor and co-author of a series of free market books for high school students that will accompany a video series by John Stossel of ABC. Mr. Assisi has also published in the Cato Journal, The Free Market and Religion and Liberty. Please welcome Dr. Assisi. Okay. Um, when Bart Frazier, a uh, former student of mine, asked me to come and introduce uh, Jim Bovard to you, I was really honored uh, to get that, uh, that uh, request. Uh, one, for Bart, because he was a great student of mine, anything I do for Bart, and secondly, because of Jim Bovard. Now, let me explain to many of you my background and how I met James Bovard. Back in the early 1990s, I was asked, in, uh, when I was running my grocery stores, uh, to teach at Avila College in Kansas City, Missouri in the MBA program. And they asked me to teach a graduate international economics class. And so I said, oh, great, I'll, I'll be more than glad to teach this, and uh, got a series of textbooks and other books. And I came across uh, Jim's fair trade fraud book. And it was stunning, it was devastating. As I read through it, the actual trade laws, how rent seekers game the system to shaft other people in violation of free trade. And as I read it, chapter by chapter, I was like, this book will be required for my students. So my MBA students had to uh, go through this. And at the end of the semester, every single student in that class said, that was the best book of the course, that fair trade fraud book. They said, you know, we had the textbook with all the graphs and all the calculus and all the equations. And I made them do that. I have a duty to have to make them do that. But all of them said, well, that was theory. Bovard's reality, in-your-face reality, whether you like it or not, it is what it is. And he's putting it right out there for you. And that was stunning because all of them said he's the only one that's talking about the real world, not some hypothetical ideal, but the real world. And so the next semester, they asked me to teach a, a public policy class graduate public policy for the master's students. And of course, I came across his book, Lost Rights. And I said, if it's anything like fair trade fraud, that is, and I read it. And page by page, I said, this is it. This is the book. 
So my graduate students had to buy like five or six books in advanced public policy theory, and I made them get the book Lost Rights. And to every single person on their, um, at the end of the semester, they said Bovard was the best book they had ever read. And the reality of what Jim did in that book, as I tell people, I am a constitutionalist libertarian. I value the Constitution more than just about anything. And that's an ideal that I hold out there. And as constitutionalists, we say this is the law of the land, and we should obey it and should honor it and respect its constraints until you read Jim's books. And you realize nobody's honoring the Constitution. It's all words on paper, just a piece of parchment in the archives, unfortunately. And so that puts a dilemma for us, us constitutionalist libertarians, and I put that right in my students' face. Here is the ideal that the Founding Fathers gave us of a country of liberty and freedom where the rights of the individual are sacred and honored by that government. And then you look at the policies. And then you look at all of the footnotes in Jim's book, Lost Rights, and then you suddenly see, here's ideal, real looks very different. It's not even close. That What's in the archives is just a facade. It's not really binding all that much, which is tragic because we have to find a way to make that ideal real. And so I always tell my students in every semester, and I've acquired that book since it came in first publication, whether it's Lost Rights and Jim's had other books, Freedom in Chains and others, and, and every few years there's another book. And I always tell my students the job of my life, the passion of my life, is to teach economics well enough so that people understand policy and that Jim Bovard never has to write another book <laughs> because he's going to put, put it in your face where it belongs. It's uncomfortable, but we need to see it. If we are to ever restore freedom to this republic, ever, we're going to have to deal with reality, not what we wish it to be, not what we hope it to be, not what it would be if uh, people were more moral and decent. You've got to deal with what is. And to deal with that, we first got to come to terms with what is. And Jim has chronicled all this and all of his works. Um, and so for this reason, I always say to my students, the most important thing you read after the Constitution Declaration of Independence is Jim's book. Now you've got to reconcile. And you have to find a way to reconcile because it's not going to be easy. It's, it's, a, it's a very tall order. We've got a lot of problems in this country. But I think we have some solutions. I think the solutions, I see so many of my students in, in front of me, past and present. And I think part of that solution comes with this next speaker. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Jim Bovard. I think if America restores its liberty, they should build monuments to this man. It's one hell of an intro. It's hard to follow. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm, it's it's hard not to argue against some of the points. <laughs> but I think I'd be more imprudent than usual for me. Um, you, you know, I've met many of Tom's former students, and I've always been impressed that they seem to have a handle on what on how things actually work, as opposed to the uh, latest e the uh, econ formulas or fashions. But I think that one downside of taking his courses. It means that you'll probably never get hired to write editorial, editorials on economic policy by the Washington Post or the New York Times. I mean, uh, you know, people who don't believe in fairy tales are automatically unfit to defend the administration's economic policies. And so people that are, are you know, this is, uh, and it's, it's, not like, it's, it's nice that people get such a good grounding. Um, I also want to thank Jacob Hornberger for hosting this, this event. I've been writing, I've enjoyed writing for him for like uh, 15 years. Uh, Jacob almost never bulks at my conclusions, though he often has trouble with my sense of humor. But, but maybe that's because he's from Texas, I don't know. Uh, before I start, I'd like to ask, how many radicals or extremists are there in this audience? If you could raise your hands. Okay, there's 32, 32. Second question, how many government agents do we have here? 
You know, it, it, it's always good to be talking to a group in which the extremists outnumber the government agents. The, uh, the, uh, last time I, uh, the last speech I gave, I screwed up when I asked that question, and I asked how many undercover government agents there are, and two or three hands started to go up, but, but then they pulled the hands down and kind of glanced around like this. You know, it's... Um, thinking about lost rights, I really appreciate the kind words. That was, that was very, very generous. Um, what I sought to do with that book is not only show the examples of abuse, but to highlight the principles on, upon which, which they were based. And there were book reviewers, and it's a refrain I've heard over the decades, is that, is that the books I write have a lot of anecdotes. Well, that's true, but, but they also have quotes from the agencies, the presidents, and the court decisions showing that those anecdotes, that the anecdotes happened for a reason. That was what the policy intended. But book reviewers will, will say, yeah, but you had a lot of anecdotes. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's called examples. It's called evidence. The, the uh, title of the talk tonight is Obama's War on Our Freedom and Prosperity. Uh, President Obama's policies... He acts as if government handouts will make us rich and that unlimited government power will make us safe. Uh, President Obama, like the two men who preceded him in the Oval Office, consistently acts as if the federal government is and must be above the law and beyond any restraint. As a result of this, we have little or no idea what the federal government is doing right now. This is true of the Federal Reserve. We have no idea who's gotten the last trillion dollars in loans. We've, uh, you know, we've gotten some information that's a little bit dated, but we don't know who's on the gravy train this moment. And as far as foreign policy, we don't know where the hit squads are going or where the drones are targeting next. And we also don't know what a lot of the federal agencies are doing here at home. And the reason is, is that the uh, government is above the law at this point. Government has become a loose cannon on the national deck. And that's a major reason why the economy's... Um, struggling is because people are afraid of what the government will do next. It's sort of like some mad hatter and you don't know what's going to come out of the hat next. Let's talk first about how the Obama administration is ravaging the Bill of Rights. As far as civil liberties goes, the motto of the Obama administration seems to be, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Obama has adopted, or at least he's blessed, or at least he's covered up, many of the worst abuses of his predecessors. The National Security Agency uh, from the early in this century has, uh, was illegally compiling records of the phone calls made by tens of millions of Americans, and most likely a number of people here in this room. And these, these were records, it was very clear it was illegal to gather them, but they were uh, gathered, the phone companies helped the government do this, and these records are still in people's personal files in the millions of dossiers at the National Security Agency and elsewhere around the federal government. Another thing that the national, it, you know, it's interesting to look at baselines. Back when I was researching uh, lost rights, there were some search and seizure issues, there were some surveillance issues, but it was more like that the, that the government would be opening somebody, some dissident's mail, or that the government would be doing a little spying here, a little spying there. We've made such a quantum leap in the last 15 years on that, because with the warrantless wiretap program that began in 2001, 2002, the NSA vacuumed up the email and other personal detail in the phone calls, the, the, the content of the phone calls, of thousands or perhaps tens or twenty thousands of Americans. And they did this all without a warrant because they were not able to justify, to give any specific rationale why this person was a national security threat. Instead, it's like, well, John called Bob and Bob called Fred and Fred called Alice. So, so the wiretap goes on all of them. Uh, it was standards that even a federal judge would not accept. But what, what is truly shocking is to see how the government is making one brazen claim after another to seize people's personal data. Three years ago, the Homeland Security Department announced that it is entitled to make, the fu make full copies of anyone's laptop hard drive or cell phone data when that person arrives back in the USA. 
This is, this is American citizens. This is everybody. There was a phrase which the Homeland Security used to show how broad this policy was. And the key phrase is absent, absent individualized suspicion. In other words, the, um, this is a policy in which the government can say, you, you, and you. And they don't need to offer any rationale. Nothing. And this is not just laptop cover, or, or laptops, but the policy also covers, quote, all papers, including books, pamphlets, and written materials commonly referred to as pocket trash or pocket litter. Now, pocket litter, that's one that gets me every time. I mean, that was the only subject that I, I got an A in in elementary school. And, 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 and now if I'm traveling through, but, you know, talking about books and manuscripts, there have been plenty of times when I was traveling to Europe or elsewhere and coming back when I was working on either lost rights or fair trade fraud or, or other, um, other books in progress. And with this policy, the federal government could have taken my entire manuscript and photocopied it and then handed a copy to the Commerce Department or the Justice Department or FBI or any agency that they chose because they, they made a blanket assertion that they're entitled to copy it simply because I was traveling abroad and I was coming back. Now, think about this in practical terms. Think about if you were walking down the street with your laptop and some thug came up, he held a gun to your head, and he demanded the right to copy all your files. You would recognize that as a profound act of aggression, the, the personal equivalent of an act of war. But why is it that so many people acquiesce when federal agents do the same thing. Now this is, the, uh, this search policy of Homeland Security, this is exactly how convicts are treated in their prison cells. And this is a policy that the, that the Obama administration has adopted and they're fighting tooth and nail in federal court to perpetuate it. Now, people might assume that you have nothing to fear from these kind of policies unless you're a Muslim or you're planning to blow up the Washington Monument. But that's only the start of the target list. The, the, the uh, Homeland Security Department is stretching the, the definition of radical or extremist to include practically anyone who condemns government power. We've already heard of some of the uh, documents and some of the state branches and some of the uh, fusion centers that have talked about, uh, that have characterized libertarians as terrorist suspects, just simply by definition, because of their beliefs. And a person doesn't need to do anything to get swept up in these investigations. Um, it's, I would not be surprised if in the coming years that we saw the same type of entrapment operations against libertarians and other freedom activists that we've been seeing, that we've been seeing against mosques for the last seven or eight years. Now, on a more primal level, there are so many ways in which the standards have fallen radically in the last 15 years. You know, going back, uh, at the time Lost Rights came out, a lot of people said I was cynical as hell about the direction the country was going in. And first of all, it wasn't that bad, and it certainly won't get any worse. Well, la-di-da. Um, one, one very clear example of, of, of a policy that's a quantum leap over most of the things I discussed in Lost Rights. How much evidence does the U.S. government, how much evidence should the U.S. government be obliged to show before it kills you? None, according to the Obama administration. And how much evidence of your wrongdoing should the government be obliged to possess before it officially targets you for killing? That's a secret, according to Obama. And if a judge forces the government to answer that question, then the terrorists will win. As part of its war against violent extremism, the Obama administration now claims the right to kill Americans without a trial, without notice, and without any chance for the targets to legally object. This is the, uh, the, the, the Bush administration started a targeted killing program, but it's been radically expanded by Obama and now includes Americans far from any war zone. Keep in mind, Obama, like Bush, says that the entire world is the battlefield for the war on terror. Now, the American Civil Liberties Union sued uh, the federal government to, uh, quote, to uh, force them to disclose the legal standard it uses to place U.S. citizens on government kill lists, end quote. But, and what did the Obama administration do in response? It invoked the doctrine of state secrets, which basically means that it doesn't, the feds don't even have to explain 
anything about the policy because that would be telling too much. And once, you know, this is such a, um, fate, uh, such a, a toxic principle. And if it's accepted that the U.S. government can label Americans as enemies of the state and kill them on its own authority, it's guaranteed that the bureaucratic wish list is going to constantly expand. A similar thing happened during the 1960s and 1970s when the FBI decided to target people who get, garnered official displeasure. And they used all types of entrapment, smear campaigns, and other things against them. Some people ended up dead because of the illegal FBI operations. Nixon White House aide Tom Charles Huston explained that the FBI's COINTEL program continually stretched its target list. It started, started with the kid with the bomb, and then it went to the kid with the picket sign. And from there it went to the kid with the bumper sticker of the opposing candidate. And it kept on going. And we have, you know, at this point, we don't know where the, um, where the administration or the various federal agencies are drawing the line as far as who's, who's a danger and, and who might need to be terminated. Um, another program that Obama has embraced and made worse is the Transportation Security Administration. It's interesting, uh, prior, to, prior to recent years, anyone who suggested that Uncle, Uncle Sam should be allowed to take naked snapshots of all, pass, all airline passengers would have been considered a deviant. But now he's a patriot. The uh, Transportation Security Agency Administration, with its whole body x-ray systems, is, doing, is taking these snapshots, these de facto nude photos, of all, of all passengers in many of the airports around the nations. Uh, TSA is promising that, that these photos will be carefully stored and that they'll never be abused. Uh, this is the same agency which promised that you wouldn't have to wait more than 10 minutes in line at the uh, TSA checkpoint at the airport. Almost everything that the TSA touches, it messes up. At some point, there's going to be a massive leak of these photos into the public domain, perhaps with faces, names, and other personal identifying uh, material. And what will Congress do at that point? Well, Congress will probably give TSA a budget increase to allow the agency to buy new software for computer security. And now, if, if someone doesn't, have a, doesn't want to have a, a massive x-ray dose and have their, uh, you know, their body uh, picks safe for a posterity, they have the option of uh, you know, choosing not to go through the uh, whole body thing. But the TSA has a policy of being rough with anybody who chooses not to uh, go through the, um, the x-ray thing. Um, and so, so the thing we have now, we have TSA agents they are squeezing people's private parts all over the country at airports, and Congress is doing almost nothing. Uh, some individuals have spoken up and protested, and that's why the TSA uh, has given itself the authority to impose attitude fines on private citizens. Now, an attitude fine, uh, if, uh, uh, if you're going through the airport and the TSA, uh, some TSA agent is giving you, is treating you, treating you very harshly and you say something or, or you protest, boom, the TSA can fine you $1,000 for your attitude. And it doesn't matter how, how roughly you were pawed or squeezed or harmed uh, prior to uh, making a comment to them. And this is, this is within the agency. There is basically no due process. It would probably take you years to get to an independent federal court on this. Um, but some people still speak up. There was a lady, a young, one young woman who was uh, recently handled uh, very roughly at a TSA checkpoint. The, the uh, TSA guard jammed her hand in the woman's crotch time and again, left the woman in tears. Uh, and so, so what she did, she wrote up her experience in detail, and she named the TSA agent, TSA agent who she felt had assaulted her. Well, that blogger has just been hit by a half million dollar defamation lawsuit by the TSA agent who victimized her. This is how arrogant the TSA people have become. And personally, I mean, I've, I've not yet seen that this woman is, you know, uh, setting up funds to help, um, help a legal fight on this, but I'd certainly be willing to chip on the price of a case of beer. And, but, but the thing I'd love to do also is to suggest questions for the deposition for the TSA agent. 
because these TSA folks almost never have to answer questions. There they are uh, treating you like dirt and, you know, uh, you know, just making, trying to shove people's nose, nose into the ground, uh, and, and yet they are just act like a bunch of um, independent princes. And Congress, when they go up on Capitol Hill, most of the congress congressmen simply line up to uh, burnish their boots and ask for to have more TSA jobs in their district. Let's, let's talk a little bit, shift to a happier subject perhaps, talk about some economic policies. President Obama's policies are helping divide America uh, between those who work for a living and those who vote for a living, as H.L. Mencken quipped some decades ago. They, for instance, Obama, the Obama administration is aggressively seeking to maximize the number of Americans depending on food stamps for their next meal. The number of food stamp recipients has increased from 26 million in 2007 to 44 million now, and, and the budget, the costs have more than doubled up to $77 billion a year. What the Obama administration is doing, it's, it's got a very vigorous effort. It's giving out a lot of grants which is encouraging groups, groups to go out and encourage everyone possibly eligible to accept food stamps. Uh, they're, they, they're doing a lot of PR campaigns. They're trying to overcome people's pride. They're almost treating a, self, a desire to be self-reliant like it was a vice. Um, another thing that USDA, uh, the Agriculture Department has done, it has swayed uh, states to greatly reduce the paperwork burden on food stamp applicants. So right now, in some states, it's possible simply to make a phone call, answer a few questions, and you get food stamps. Or a lot of other places, you just fill out a form on the internet and you get food stamps. If only paying taxes was that easy. <laughs> but, you know, for sure, it's a hell of a lot easier now to get food stamps than it is, than it is to go for a job interview. Maybe that's why the unemployment rate's so high. And, you know, a, a, another trick that's been used to expand food stamp enrollment is the feds have swayed 40 states, almost 40 states, to drop the asset test for food stamp recipients. What that means is millionaires in many states now qualify for food stamps as long as they have little or no monthly income. The, uh, the poster boy for this new policy is a guy, a 59-year-old guy by the name of uh, Leroy Fick, lives in rural Michigan. Fick recently won a $2 million, $2 million lottery jackpot in Michigan, but the uh, Michigan Department of Human Services ruled that Fick could continue receiving food stamps. And as the Detroit News explained, if Fick had chosen to accept monthly payments of his jackpot, the winnings would have been considered income. But by choosing a lump sum payment, the winnings were assets and are not counted in food stamp eligibility. Now, it's ironic, a couple decades ago, liberals derided Ronald Reagan's references to welfare queens and Cadillacs. But Obama's, Obama's policies could permit trust fund babies driving Rolls Royces to get free food courtesy of Uncle Sam. Part of this vast expansion of the food stamp program was, has been sold under the idea that it is a, a program to improve nutrition, but it's not. It's simply designed to boost calorie intake. And this is why study after study has linked food stamps to obesity. And yet USDA has vetoed all proposals from local or state governments to prevent food stamps from being used for junk food. And with the Fed's approval, food stamps are increasingly being, being redeemed uh, at fast food restaurants. But how much freedom of choice should people have when they're spending other people's money? Now, the, um, the, uh, another, another thing the Obama administration is doing, it's attacking some of the efforts by state and local governments to prevent food stamp fraud. And they have a good reason for that. And, and the reason is food stamps are going to make America prosperous. Because something that the uh, administration often quotes is that for every $5 in food stamps passed out, that generates $8 in additional economic activity. Um, and what's the evidence? Well, somebody had a formula, maybe, maybe it was an equation, but there's probably four or five variable, variables in the equation, so it's true. And it's interesting that they just keep repeating this, and it's almost as if it's a magic incantation. 
and it's supposed to silence any doubt about whether it's a wise policy to be um, throwing these out there. Now, it's, you know, I was thinking about that multiplier effect, and I was wondering what sort of multiplier effect it would have if, when I'm driving home tonight, if I stopped and robbed a giant grocery store. Now, it, it, it might have a multiplier effect that might create jobs for police, prosecutors, and prison guards. Um, that's probably a more effective multiplier than giving food stamps. Now, uh, another favorite Obama program that's, fu uh, that's happening to be fueling a, uh, um, a nationwide wave of crime in uh, some uh, suburban areas and cities is Section 8. Section 8 housing subsidies have been around since the 19, 1970s. They've been sharply expanded in the last 15 years. What, what happened in the 1990s, uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, they were consistently embarrassed by the, the uh, horrible crimes in public housing projects. So what happened was uh, Section 8 was expanded to give public housing residents vouchers to move to, suburb, uh, to move to the suburbs, to move to much nicer places, to upscale neighborhoods. Section 8's budget has almost tripled in the last 16 years. Now it picks up the uh, rent for more than 2 million households. In, in many locales, Section 8 seeks to deliver an upper middle class living standard to people on welfare. For instance, in, the Washington, in Washington, D.C., Section, re Section 8 recipients can get a monthly subsidy of almost $2,500. And in, in, in Honolulu, it's $2,700. In Stanford, Connecticut, it's almost $3,000 per month in subsidy. Um, unfortunately, just giving vouchers to the public housing uh, former residents has simply changed the distribution of crime. It did not solve the crime problem. In cities across the country, Louisville, Memphis, Indianapolis, violent crime skyrocketed in neighborhoods where Section 8 recipients resettled. But HUD, HUD is responding to this because HUD is very upset that some local governments are trying to um, crack down on the abuses by Section 8 recipients. So HUD seems to be creating a new civil right, and that is the, the right to raise hell and subsidize housing in nice neighborhoods. The, the uh, Cincinnati Metropolitan Housing Authority recently signed a conciliation agreement with HUD, and it, uh, the Housing Authority pledged that it would cease penalizing Section 8 recipients for loud music and other nuisances. A HUD spokesman explained that, that policing Section 8 tenants' behavior was an ineffective use of resources. But that's an, uh, that's an objection that never stopped any HUD program before. HUD is also invoking the Fair Housing Act to bludgeon Cincinnati suburbs into accepting far more Section 8 renters than many locales want. Um, as, as one online commenter uh, scoffed, where in the Fair Housing Act does it give the right to live where you want on someone else's money? But what F HUD has done with the Fair Housing Law and with these Section 8 subsidies, it is trying to change the uh, definition of unfair housing. And it's what it's trying to do is get this income mix throughout the country. And HUD admits that sometimes Section 8 re recipients concentrating them in a neighborhood can have adverse uh, consequences for the uh, local area. What's HUD's solution? To make the subsidies even higher, to allow the Section 8 recipients to move into even more upscale neighborhoods. I mean, for some reason, HUD's answer is always to spend more money. It's, it, it's interesting, as you would expect, Section 8 is very popular. Um, I mentioned the subsidy in D.C. is almost 2,500 a month. Almost 10% of the population of, of, of Washington, D.C. is on the Section 8 waiting list. Almost 10% of the population. There was a, um, in East Point, Georgia last year, there was, the, the local government announced that people could show up at a certain day to get their Section 8 applications. 30,000 people turned out seeking these applications. More than 60 people were injured in a, in a riot. Um, a HUD assistant secretary said that the East Point ruckus proved that, quote, people really do need some deeply affordable rental assistance and people need it badly. This is HUD logic. I love it. Actually, what the, what the clamor for Section 8 shows is simply that people enjoy freebies. And if government is offering these lavish subsidies, people are going to show up and people are going to push to get them. 
Liberals often justify Section 8 subsidies, uh, though e even though they're expensive, is, um, you know, it's worthwhile because it allows people to move from the inner cities to the suburbs or other areas where they're much more, e they're more likely to find jobs. Section 8 works, uh, a person has to, to um, give, have to spend 30% of their own income for rent and then the government picks up the balance. Unless they have no income and then it's free. And so, there's a bunch, you know, uh, this is a question for the economic students. What would you forecast the impact of Section 8 is on a person's subsequent earnings? There you go. Well, I mean, uh, that's right, but it means that you'll never be a federal policymaker. There is a, a forthcoming American e uh, Economic Review article concludes that receiving Section 8 benefits uh, reduces the earnings of able-bodied working age recipients by about 10 percent. And 10 percent is a huge impact, uh, especially for folks in lower to moderate uh, um, income area. But that's a, a mere technicality because the, the, uh, the thing that's important is that the program intends to encourage people to seek, seek work. And, and politicians' proclaimed intentions are the most important reality, at least in Washington. Now, food stamps and Section 8 are only two examples of a bevy of federal programs that now encourage people to rely on government instead of themselves. At some point, the sheer number of handout recipients transforms the purpose of government from maintaining order to confiscating as much as possible from vulnerable taxpayers. Election, uh, elections nowadays, instead of a vote on what government should, should do, have become referendums on how much it should take. And unfortunately, with Obama's approach to public policy, it's based on a blind faith in government power as long as it's held by himself. And it doesn't matter how often it's failed in the past, simply spending more money is a way to perpetuate his own power. And unfortunately, we have at least one more year of this circus. But hopefully things will be, um, well, anyhow. Uh, with that, I'll draw the curtain of mercy and go to questions. Sorry. Mr. Bovard, right, can you hear me? What? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, it strikes me that a uh, large percentage of the audience here have been uh, born after the fall of the Soviet Union and are not familiar with uh, the stories that we heard as children about how terrible it would be to live under such a system. Now, of course, we are developing the same system that uh, the Soviet Union was told to us and that, that people tried to escape from. I mean, I, w I was wondering, uh, some time ago I read an article that you had written about your travels. Um, I, I, do you remember where that was, that, that you had traveled um, and you weren't allowed to have a map? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, that was the could Orient you, Express to hell. Could you please tell us a little bit? I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that we're talking to people who are so used to, as we pointed out, this whole crowd probably has never lived without the Internet. I mean, this is a whole different group of people. They don't even remember what freedoms were because they haven't lived in them. Talk about what happens when they lose them. Well, that's, that's a broad question, uh, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the story that, uh, that Muriel, Muriel mentioned was, um, it was for the Freeman Magazine. It was called Orient Express to Hell. It was about a train trip I did in 19, late 1987 from uh, Budapest, Hungary to Bucharest, Romania. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, th that was the train route that was part of the route that was originally followed from the original Orient Express. It started in the late 1880s from Paris to, I think, Istanbul or Constantinople, whatever. And uh, when that train was first launched, it was famous for being, having very lavish food. 
But if you're riding that train in, in Hungary, or especially in, in Romania, well, it's, it's a good place for a diet plan. <laughs> uh, because there was almost no food, and um, once uh, the, the uh, train stopped at the Hungarian-Romanian border, and that was uh, in Transylvania. And it was up in the mountains, and it was in November, and there was this uh, low-hanging cloud, and there was these, uh, the, um, there was these um, guards, military guards with German shepherds that kept circling, circling the train in case anybody tried to jump on or jump off. And the, and the uh, border guards came and searched my cabin four times. And after that, somebody brought a very heavy bolt and bolted me into the cabin so that I would not contam uh, contaminate anybody in Romania with my ideas. And I was thinking, you know, if someone gets a private cabin in, uh, in uh, France or Germany, there's an extra charge, but it was free in Romania. <laughs> but, and something, I, something I'd been told in, uh, in uh, Budapest, bef that people were being arrested in Romania simply for having maps. Maps of the, uh, of the cities, maps of the country, whatever. So as I was heading for the border and the, and the Hungarian part, I was reading my maps one last time and then tearing them up in little pieces and throwing them out the window because I knew I'd be searched. Um, and actually, I'd, I'd, I'd been searched when I was traveling in Czechoslova uh, Czechoslovakia into East Germany earlier that year. I'd had a very challenging time at a, a border uh, crossing near Dresden when the German guards had discovered some papers on me, which I thought were, were rather innocuous. I was wrong. It doesn't take much to excite German border guards. Uh, East German military communist border guards, and I was marched away from that border and interrogated for three hours. And uh, luckily I'd studied a little bit of German, uh, German by that point, so I was really good at sounding stupid. <laughs> um, and I think after about three hours at the, uh, well, I was interrogated by people at three different levels, and at each higher level the, the military officer knew less English which was really helpful, which was really helpful because, you know, I, you know, as a teenager in my early 20s, I'd had a lot of practice in this country answering questions from police. <laughs> and so, so I just figured, okay, this is, you know, this is, it's kind of the same except that if I give the wrong answers, I might kind of vanish here for a long time. But uh, the East Germans uh, eventually let me go, though they confiscated all my papers, which I made copies of before I crossed the Iron Curtain, so that wasn't so bad. But the, the thing that was striking in Romania was you had Ceausescu uh, was the uh, dictator there, and he was a favorite of the World Bank. World Bank, had, uh, he, was one of the, he was by far probably the worst dictator in Europe, but the World Bank loved him because he was all in favor of central control. He was very much a socialist, but the uh, World Bank liked bank rolling socialists because they felt like they were good credit risks. And the, and, and the World Bank was so obscene that they even praised Ceausescu, the um, dictator, let's just call him the dictator, that's easier, uh, praised him for recognizing population as a factor of production. And what that meant was what the Romanian government did was basically ban contraceptives and prohibited abortions and they would go and force women to have uh, gynecological exams every few months to make sure in case, in case that, they, that they were pregnant that they would not do anything to uh, make the baby vanish. And so you had the most intrusive policy imaginable at the same time the government was creating these horrendous food shortages. I mean, people in Romania on the streets of Bucharest just looked famished. And just to, to see how they were, you know, just to see the, the, uh, see the gauntness and people were dressed, uh, you know, worse than West Virginia. Um, and it was, uh, there, was, uh, there, was, uh, there was a memory I have of riding on that train as we're getting closer to uh, Bucharest. We were passing by a factory town, maybe Brazov or something like that. And at some point, I, I heard a bunch of guys, like they're outside my door, and then I heard a, a bolt, like someone had a bolt cutter, and, and they jammed open the door, and four or five factory workers poured into, the, uh, into, the, uh, into my room, my uh, train room, because they'd heard there was a foreigner on board, and, and, and they wanted to see him. And I was wearing the same kind of boots then that I am now. These are basically, basically your leather clod hoppers, and one or two of the guys just kind of bent down, he was touching the boots because it was as if he'd never seen leather boots before. 
And that was so sad because if you're an agriculture worker or a factory worker, you need good boots, plain and simple. And this is a country that was, uh, that was the um, breadbasket of Europe before World War I. And so I'm sure the agricultural workers had good boots back then. And they had decent diets. But there was this, you know, just people were so emaciated. And to see that, to see that in person, and to see the, the fear in people's faces, that was, uh, that was a real sign of what, um, what government, what, what a, a, um, a horrible government can generate. And that's part of what, you know, I hope this country is not going in the direction of, because there's, I think, a lot more fear than there was 10 years ago. We're talking about anniversaries here. And it, it's interesting to see how the politicians play on that fear. There was a, a Cornell study that looked at the, um, from um, the, uh, the first three years of the war on terror and, and looked at how people reacted to some of the terror alerts. And it, it turned out that, that each time the government would issue a terror warning, the president's approval rating would increase by 3%. And so you had a lot of false terror warnings, and 3% was basically the margin by which George W. got reelected. He was running against a rascal and an idiot, but that's another question. Um, but to see how, how fear becomes institutionalized. And the, uh, the, the most exciting part of that visit to Romania was exiting the country. Um, I, I bought a ticket for a Lufthansa flight from uh, Bucharest to Frankfurt, and it was interesting, there was such institutionalized bribery in that country. And going to the airport, uh, Kent cigarettes were the second currency, almost the first currency in Romania. And so I had a couple cartons of Kent's, I was passing those out to bribes, or sometimes if somebody had a really good sad story, I'd give them a, a pack of cigarettes. People would use these as bribes to get doctors to care for them, or things like that. And so I was at the airport and I was passing out my final packs of Kent because I saw some, other, I saw some German businessmen who were not giving bribes, and the guards were tearing their luggage to pieces. And I was thinking, okay, I think I'll try to avoid this. And I'd I, I known I was being followed in uh, Bucharest, and so, kind of an old habit, I would, um, if I saw something which I wanted to keep in memory, I'd, I'd, I'd write one word on my palm. It's a habit that goes back many years. But if I had one word, I, I could use that like a fishing hook in my memory and pull up, oh yeah, there's this, 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 and get 10 other associations. So I, I was taking notes because I, I noticed when I was in other parts of the East Block that I had a little notebook. If I pulled out the notebook to write things down, people acted like I pulled out a pipe bomb. People would just scurry. Uh, so, and so I had my notes. Uh, I didn't have my notebook, but I just... So I was, I was going through the uh, final, final station, and uh, I, I reached the exit of the airport. There was a tarmac. There was only one guard left, this kind of fat guy with a submachine gun. And so, you know, walking past, you had to show him, hold up your ticket and your passport. So I did. And I was walking past. And I was just about ready to take the first step up the steps to the uh, jetliner. And I hear this halt. This guy shouting halt. And he comes running over, and his machine gun's bouncing off his big old belly. And, and he grabs my arm, and he flips my wrist over, and he points at my hand. And he said, what is that? And so I looked at my hand. I looked at him, and I said, it's ink. And he said, oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was really glad when that plane left Romanian airspace, because uh, I, I, had I, had, I had a bunch of very small notebooks with me that I jammed inside my pants and other places. And if they'd searched me, it would have looked bad. I was, there, I was there illegally. I was there on a tourist visa. I was working as a journalist. But that's what I normally do. So. But thanks very much for that question. Um, the microphone man. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, this is less about the administration, but given the election has a bit to do with the future of freedom. Um, the Tea Party is probably the most public representative of libertarianism to the American Republic, to the American public. But do you think that the Tea Party in particular and some of their more well-known faces like Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin actually represent libertarianism or more reactionary react reactionaries? Well, you know, it's always hard for me to criticize Sarah Palin. Um, you know, I hope that the Tea Party is not, not the most visible representation of libertarianism. 
I don't know what is, but I hope it's not the Tea Party. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it's, okay, that's a good answer. Um, there are some very good elements in the Tea Party. Um, I went to a, um, a, a, a Tea Party rally in Rockville and wrote a story about it for the Christian Science Monitor April, May, a year ago. Um, it's great to see folks with the courage to stand up and, sp and uh, say, say that they're going to um, stand up and fight for their freedom. And some of them are and some of them will. And that's good. Um, I know people like Ernie Hancock and others are working to try to get, get a, uh, shall we say, a, a larger knowledge base among some of the Tea Party supporters. And I think that would help a great deal because I think, many, uh, I think many of the Tea Party people understand uh, how government intervention can be socialism or how trusting politicians with their savings is r really dangerous. Some of them are, do not understand as well the peril of government uh, wiretapping or interrogation methods or just uh, or of, of letting presidents bomb foreign countries on their own fiat. You know, it's... it's it's, it's fascinating to see how Americans have responded to, to um, the uh, biggest PR show Obama's done this year. And I've been mystified why the U.S. government borrowed money from China to pay for bombing Libya to pave the way for French oil companies. And that seems to be the only thing that's going to be happening in that country. You, you have a, you know, and why in Hades the U.S. had to get involved in that is a mystery to me. Um, you know, Sarah Palin, I think, is pretty much of a demagogue. Um, there were some issues she was good on, but, I mean, she's flip-flopped a lot of times. And she has, she has never shown a fundamental concern about unlimited government power as long as it was controlled by Republicans. So. Mr. Bovard. Every year, the United States government gives millions and billions of dollars to Pakistan in order to get their cooperation in the war on terror. What is your thought on foreign aid as a tool to build global allies? Um, foreign aid has been called walking around money for the Secretary of State. Uh, the, the, the U.S. government gives all these billions, and because of that, the Secretary of State gets a nice reception when he or she visits. I, you know... I think it'd be a lot, a lot cheaper simply to buy, buy a red carpet and put it in the plane of the Secretary of State that she has when she travels around. Foreign aid has been a, a curse to much of the third world. Foreign aid has spurred so much corruption. Uh, the, George Bush recognized that and then uh, so he launched a new program to give bribes to foreign governments that promised to cut back on their corruption, cut back on their bribery. But a bribe to reduce bribery, it didn't work out very well. Um, there's so much, so much evidence that, these, that this program has worked badly. There was a story, uh, for, um, look at Afghanistan. I, I guess we've given more than $50 billion in economic aid, uh, foreign aid to Afghanistan over the last 10 years. It has worked out very badly in that country. It has spawned, it's made, uh, it, it has raised, has turned Afghanistan into the most corrupt country in the world, according to Transparency International. And, okay, I say that, that's simply an abstraction. Okay, it doesn't, you know, doesn't register with you. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal last Saturday about Afghan hospitals, uh, about uh, Afghan's number one military hospital. It was the, um, it's, it's the Afghan equivalent of Walter Reed Hospital. And um, it's, a, you know, it's uh, massively funded by U.S. tax dollars, paying the salaries of the doctors and the nurses. They've had some problems. For instance, if patients are not able to pay bribes, then a number of patients have been starved to death. And this is, this, this is not my, my conclusion. It was documented very well in the Wall Street Journal that it's so profoundly corrupt in that hospital that patients are starving to death if they cannot pay bribes. And this is a gift of the U.S. government and U.S. taxpayers to Afghanistan. And it has been known for years of this horrendous corruption at this hospital. And another major problem there is that there's, there's all this um, stealing of uh, medicines. For instance, um, there's, you know, um, it's been clear that many, that, that, that many of the patients going in for major surgery 
uh, didn't have sedatives or, or anesthesia. It's because the uh, doctors or other staff had stolen it and sold it. And th there's a horrendous infections, a very high fatality rate from relatively minor injuries, again, because so many of the medical supplies have been stolen by the staff and sold. And the U.S. government has known this for years, and they've kept financing this. A Wall Street Journal story said, in, last, in recent months, it's not as bad. Oh, yeah, great. That's always the ending, almost always the ending. But it's, it's, it's damning that the U.S. government is so unable to control uh, that the USA cannot even stop Afghan hospitals from starving to death uh, Afghan police or military patients. And we expect the people in that country to rally around that government to fight for it. I wouldn't fight for a government like that. So. Hey, how you doing? Good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I got two questions. Uh, question one is um, when the uh, U.S. government uh, was about to default and Obama kept rejecting any idea to raise the cap or do anything to stop the default, he kind of caused, uh, caused our credit rating to slip and he caused a, a gold market bubble effect because gold jumped about $300. Um, what kind of effect overall is that going to have uh, going forward? And also, I was hoping you were going to touch on the uh, Obamacare and how he intends to raise uh, wealthy taxpayers' uh, tax, uh, tax dollars to pay for it. Now, the, the, the first question precisely was, I, I mean, is, is it possible to clarify your first question? first question is kind of what kind of impact is that going to have on the market since, um, or in the economy due to the fact that our credit rating as a country has slipped from AAA down to AA+. Plus? Well, I, I, I'd like to make a distinction. It wasn't the credit rating for our country. It was the credit rating for the government. And I have thought for a long time that, that, that the U.S. government's credit rating was too high. And I don't know that it's a bad thing that the government's credit rating falls. Because I don't want it to be so easy for the U.S. government to borrow money. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, that's a Pandora's box for our future. Uh, I, I, I'd much rather have the politicians on a short leash money-wise. I mean, it'd be great to see the uh, Federal Reserve opened up, if not shut down, because the uh, Federal Reserve has become a huge arm of the Obama administration. Even though it was the Federal Reserve with its interest rate policies and other things that helped cause so much of the housing bust and has destabilized tens of millions of Americans' lives. And yet, for some reason, the, uh, the, the, the establishment media seems to always think that the answer is, is one more injection. I mean, uh, heroin addicts learn faster than the Washington Post. <laughs> oh, the, the, uh, the, the second thing was a question about Obamacare and how it's going to be financed. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm sure the president will be honest with us about that. No, I mean, I assume that he's just waiting for some surtax or whatever, so. I mean, as someone who's self-employed and, and uh, contracts directly with an insurance company, I mean, ever since that, that Obamacare passed, I've gotten these various letters. I now have a, uh, uh, one more free benefit. I have this free benefit, and I have that free benefit. I say, I hit the jackpot, you know, but I know it's all crap because the costs are going to increase and things are going to be squeezed, and... Uh, it's, just, it's, it's so unsavory for politicians of both parties to be up there and acting like I have given you this benefit. It's simply they have cracked the whip over someone and on a short-term basis it, it, it looks like it's a benefit, but you know, things don't work out there, that way. Life doesn't work that way. Hi. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, a lot of your work is kind of, uh, you know, given us horror stories, uh, and I, you know, I follow your work pretty well, and uh, I've read a lot of the horror stories. Uh, how do you think uh, it gets better, or does it get better, you know, short of uh, some sort of Soviet-style collapse of the, of the U.S. government? Well, I mean, there are some positive trends. There's, there's been a huge increase in the quality of American beer the last 20 years. <laughs> um... 
I honestly don't know. I mean, that's something which I've wrestled with. My, the last book I did was entitled Attention Deficit Democracy. And it was um, not even as optimistic as Lost Rights. Um, because I see some of the trend lines and government has gotten larger and larger and the average citizen is paying probably even less attention. And it seems easier for the politicians to demagogue, in part because of 9-11, in part because of... Um, it's, it, it started, it got a lot worse under Bill Clinton. There was almost more of an emotional bonding between the government and the people. And Clinton was a master of all these little uh, knick-knack little programs, such as AmeriCorps, where they're supposed to make you feel warm and fuzzy about the government, and promising you this and promising you that, and, you know, the old mantra, feeling your pain, which a lot of people may have forgotten. Um, and I think as soon as people feel emotionally vested in the government, then they're um, compromised as far as being able to, uh, for self-government. Because the um, founding fathers thought that, you know, uh, founding fathers, I, my understanding is that they hoped that the citizens would have enough gumption and spine in their fiber to stand and, and to be apart from the government so that they could judge the government and they could put the government in its place. But as soon as you have, you know, American democracy is practically capsized at this point because you've probably got more than half the population getting either uh, on the government payroll or in the government benefit roll. And so it's, just, it's natural the same thing happened in ancient Rome. It's, it's helped ruin a number of other democracies. Um, and it's, it's been surprising to me to see, to see how the media has been in some ways even denser than the politicians. Because to see most of the editorial pages, uh, they simply are not willing to admit reality and to admit that the U.S. government has become far too powerful and far too arbitrary and too often oppressive. I mean, that's, that's practically considered to be hate speech at this point. Um, so, as far as where I see things going, um, there's some bumps coming up, you know, there's some bumps, I don't know what happens after the bumps. I mean, it, it might be that some of those bumps will knock sense into people. I ain't holding my breath. Um, but what needs to be found is a way to put the leash back on the government and on the politicians. And a key part of that is for citizens to have a lot more self-respect and to value their own liberty and independence. I mean, folks who, uh, folks who are, you know, self-reliant have a different attitude to government than folks who are waiting for the government to come fix their flat tire as metaphor or anything else. And so it, it's, it, it's a question of character strength. And going back to the Founding Fathers, they were very conscious that the, um, that the preservation of liberty depended on character strength. Character has been out of fashion for a long time. Character, strength, willpower. Uh, so maybe those fashions will change in time that there can be a backlash and push back against the uh, politicians. Because it's not, it's, it's not so much the Democrats or, or, or the Republicans, it's politicians as a class. They are a vested interest in the same way. You know, one very positive trend in the last two, two years since Obama took office, Americans are recognizing far more that government employees are a separate class interest. That's why there's been the backlash against the government benefits and the salaries and the perks. That's a hugely positive thing. Governments, uh, uh, governments are uh, losing payroll at this point. I mean, that's something, that's one of the most positive trends out on the horizon. Uh, it'd be great if government could lose half its payroll. And it would cause some dislocation, but in the long term, this would be a much freer country. Because it's, it's, it's almost like there's this dead weight. You know, if you have, you have this union, this government union, that government union, and this government union, and all their hangers on, and they're always in favor of government as a, a separate interest, government as a class. And that's, but that's done a huge amount to drag down the economy and uh, prosperity, so. Any other questions? Question? Good. There's one up there, too. Yeah, this will be the last question. Oh, okay. Um, 
as you said, you talking about like what people they need to like uh, I guess like get character or not get character strength, but there would have to be more of a movement toward like following that type of attitude. But do third party votes impact this uh, situation? Like, can it help this, or is it just another waste of time? Well, it, it, it probably varies from election to election and third party. I mean, if you're voting for the, um, no, I shouldn't make off-color jokes. Um, no, it's, it, it's possible for a third party to have a very positive impact. There, there have been libertarian candidates who I think have helped wake Americans up to freedom. Um, people forget Ron Paul was a Libertarian Party candidate for president in 1988. Um, there, there are th some things the Libertarian Party has, has done that has been very helpful, some other things not as helpful. Um, I think, I, I think short-term, I, I don't see a major impact from third parties. That, that's something which could change quickly, though, because if you think of 1992, Ross Perot came out of nowhere, and he got 19% of the vote in the final um, uh, on, on election day. So I think it's possible that there would be a, a libertarian candidate or a libertarian leaning candidate. For instance, if the, um, you know, if, if voters have a choice next year of uh, Romney versus Obama, it's kind of like, you know, why bother? And if it's obviously such a dead end choice, then, um, you know, uh, basically it means that the Bill of Rights is shafted no matter who wins. Uh, sure. I mean, voting for a third party then could have a very positive impact. So, so that's a roundabout answer. One more question or are we done? Uh, one more, yes. Uh, microphone, can we? Hi. Um, I wanted to see if you could talk about uh, Ron Paul's influence on the Republican candidates for the 2012 election. Uh, for example, for the first time ever, candidates like uh, Rick Perry or Newt Gingrich are discussing monetary policy in the Federal Reserve, and also people like John Huntsman and Michelle Bachman are discussing um, scaling back our influence overseas with the military. Uh, I just wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think Ron Paul has had a huge positive influence. I'm really glad he's running for president. He's putting a lot of great ideas out there. Uh, Ron Paul has a long history of, a man, of being a man of principle, especially during the time he's in Congress. And uh, it's, it's, it's really amusing to hear people like Gingrich talk about audit the Fed because these are, you know, it's kind of like, so I wonder where you learned that one from. Um, and it seems like Ron Paul's campaign this year is more focused and harder hitting and off to a much better start. Um, I hope he can go very far in the GOP race because he is a real breath of fresh air. He's, um, he's almost an unpolitician. Um, I've heard him criticized because he's not some silver-tongued orator. I certainly can't criticize him for that because I'm not either. Um, but th but th there's a passion he brings. There's a passion about individual freedom, which Ron Paul brings to the stump, which no other candidate brings. There, uh, 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 no other candidate in these debates, and uh, they're trying to mock some of his rhetoric, but to hear these lifetime politicians say, yeah, and the government's too big. I mean, don't give me this crap. I mean, just, I mean, I mean, uh, most of these other candidates have had plenty of chances to stand up against big government, and instead they were there waiting to uh, harvest the, the power or the uh, contributions from expanding it. So I think it's great to see Ron Paul out there, and it's, it's exciting to see how well he's done, and it's nice to see him kicking butt. So. Should I say something? Or? Yeah, thanks very much for coming. Uh, this is uh, this can be covered by all three of the networks. Uh, <laughs> But thanks for coming. It's a, a nice to talk to a very well-informed audience, and I appreciate the questions, and um, it's, it's fun to exchange the ideas here. So thanks very much.